Okay, welcome and good morning uh, to this uh, seventh lecture in inverse problems. Um, first, some organizational remarks. First, what I'm currently doing about compact operators is more or less a copy of the book by Hochstadt uh, on uh, integral operators. And uh, so if you want some background information or if you want to look at some proofs a little more closely, then uh, I re definitely recommend this. And I think the, the proofs are excellent. I'm, I really love that book and the style. Uh, then next thing, uh, of course, I sometimes make mistakes in these videos. Uh, if I do and I notice, I won't always re-record all the videos, but uh, rather correct these mistakes, these errors in uh, in the PDFs that come with the videos. So uh, if I reckon, if I realize that there's a problem or an error somewhere, then um, I write this in the corresponding comments. And uh, if you take the PDFs as a reference, then there should be a correction. Next thing, and maybe most important uh, for you, I decided to make a um, learning script available in the Learn Web. So that's a script that contains all uh, the lemmas, um, corollaries, and theorems, whatever you have from the uh, 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 from the lecture. But uh, it does not contain the proof, so it's not a replacement for the lecture. But uh, at least you can look this up, and uh, you can find the proofs then either in the corresponding PDFs or in the videos. Okay, so uh, I hope that this is going to be useful for you. And uh, I mean, this is somehow the lower bound of what you should take from this lecture. Now let's start with a little rehearsal. Uh, last time we finished by proving a representation theorem, which is very basic for our analysis of inverse problems. And uh, it went like this. Let K be any compact and self-adjoint operator from a Hilbert space X to X. Uh, and uh, we proved that very constructively, we proved that there is a set UK of, in a sense, all orthonormal eigenvectors corresponding to eigenvectors lambda K not equal to zero, such that every element U uh, for all U and U, we have that uh, U can be represented as an infinite linear combination of the UK plus an element U perp, which is uh, orthonormal to all the UKs and thus is in the kernel of U. So this is exactly what this says. And um, uh, let us uh, first um, look at why we've written this down in such a strange way. I mean, what you could expect is why do we make that distinction between lambda equal to zero and lambda lambda k equal to zero and lambda k not equal to zero? Uh, it sounds like it would be a good idea to look at the orthonormal space or look at the um, uh, at the kernel of k, uh, take a basis there, and uh, then just add it to the uk's, and then we have a complete system of eigenvalues for all I, for, of eigenvectors for all eigenvalues. And uh, um, so that would be great. And we could uh, do without this distinction between kernel and not kernel. Well, the thing is that simply doesn't work. And the thing is that um, we never assumed that our uh, vector space or the vector spaces that we look at have a countable basis. So um, when we look at the orthonormal space to, uh, uh, to all eigenvectors, um, it's not guaranteed that this, is, that this one has a countable basis. So it may well be overcountable. And um, so we cannot do that, right? Because so we have to uh, take this countable basis for the range. And then there's something which may actually be overcountable uh, in have an overcountable di dimension um, possibly. Okay, so, um, but uh, we can already note that there is something which is a little bit surprising. We never assumed that the basis is countable, 
But it turns out that at least for compact self-adjoint operators, the range of the operators is always countable because you know, we have a basis given by all these UKs here, right? Okay. Okay. Um, all right, infinite basis given by this UK. Okay, so um, that's one thing. Um, but what happens if we restrict ourselves to finite dimensional operators? So uh, let's assume now that X is finite dimensional. Um, what, uh, which well, which um, theorem of linear algebra does this correspond to? Well, of course, it says that uh, if uh, everything is finite dimensional, then the perpendicular space to uh, the to the linear combination to the UKs to the um, then the null space of K is, uh, of course, finite dimensional. So uh, we can take an orthonormal system or an orthonormal basis for that and add it to the UK. And uh, together with the UK, we then get a complete system, a complete orthonormal system of eigenvectors uh, in uh, in X for finite dimensional system, for finite dimensional vector spaces. So this amounts to saying that uh, for self-adjoint compact operators between finite dimensional spaces, there is always an orthonormal basis. And that's something that's uh, very, very well known from linear algebra. If A is a matrix, let's assume that uh, the operator K is represented by a matrix, uh, then it is diagonalizable with respect to, um, to, an, to a unitary matrix. And that amounts to saying that uh, there is an orthonormal set uh, on orthonormal basis of eigenvectors in that space. And that's very well known. So for matrices, this just means that uh, a matrix A can be written in the form of U, uh, D, U transpose. If a represents a self-adjoint operator, which means that A is symmetric and D is a, D is a diagonal matrix and U is unitary. Okay, so, but that's also, that's all, of course, only if the dimension of x is smaller than infinity. So that's a very well known from, from linear algebra. Next, uh, why are representation theorems like these very important for inverse problems? Well, before we go on, and you will see even better why that is, let's uh, uh, start with a very simple example, uh, or some very simple application. Uh, you already saw that inverse problems is a lot about um, investigating the error of measurements. And we already noted that uh, if instead of a U in U, we measure a U tilde in U, uh, which can be written as um, a U tilde in U, which can be written as U plus some noise n, uh, then uh, the error that we make when evaluating uh, an operator on that u can be written, uh, can be estimated as ku minus ku tilde. That's the error that we make when applying u uh, or ut uh, u tilde to u instead of u. Now, this is smaller or equal to norm k times the norm of epsilon. Okay, so the maximum error amplification factor is norm of k, but using the theory that uh, the theorem that we just proved, uh, we can uh, further, we can estimate that error much much better. Uh -huh. Now, assume that uh, since uh, eps um, uh, and epsilon and of course we have the L two norm of the noise should be smaller than epsilon. I'm sorry. 
Okay, um, so uh, let us represent the error in terms of the eigenvalues of u, um, like in the theorem. So we can represent epsilon as the sum over all k scalar product of epsilon times u, uh, uh, with uk times uk plus some, well, epsilon perp, which is in the kernel of k. Now, let's look at, uh, again, at norm ku minus k u tilde, which is, of course, nothing but the norm of k times, um, yeah, k times epsilon, uh, and I already insert the representation scalar product of epsilon with uk times uk plus some epsilon pulp. Okay, and um, maybe we take the square. I don't know. Probably we use that. Okay, now let's look at that. Um, first of all, k epsilon perp goes away because um, epsilon perp is in the null space of k. So we already notice if we make errors that are actually in the null space of k, it doesn't have any effect. So uh, that's great. What is left is we have something like sum over all k, scalar product of epsilon and uk, k uk, but uk is an uh, eigenvalue of k with uh, respect to lambda k. So this is nothing but lambda k times uk. And I, I don't need the square, I just realize. Okay, so, uh, and this now can be estimated as the sum over all k, absolute value of lambda k, um, scalar product of epsilon and uk, absolute value, times the norm of uk, and uh, so uh, that's, um, that's one, right? Because that's an orthonormal system. Okay, now um, this gives us much more insight in uh, how the error behaves. First of all, as I've just noted, if, if we make an error that's actually in the null space of K, that has no effect. Ever. If we make an error with respect only to one eigenvalue, eigenvector, then, uh, for example, let's say we're getting the uh, we're getting the scalar product of epsilon with, with u one wrong. Then the uh, uh, amplification factor is lambda one, an absolute value of lambda one, and uh, we already know that's nothing but the operator norm of k. So uh, that's actually the worst thing that can happen. Uh, if we make an error exclusively in, di in the direction of uh, the first eigenvector, then we get an ampl amplification of, um, of the norm of k. Otherwise, we get something. Let's, let's say now that uh, we make an error in the direction of uk only, then the amplification factor is lambda k um, absolute value of lambda k, which may be possibly much larger than lambda 1, and at least it's not there. Okay, so what this means is um, that certain errors will make, uh, will be, um, will, uh, certain errors will cause very high errors uh, in the result. Um, uh, and some errors will cause no error at all in the result. And so the idea might be to how I, how somehow split up the whole space into pro, into one um, into one part of the space into one subspace that generates large errors and uh, one subspace that produces small errors. And uh, you see which one is which, right? I mean, the uh, first eigenvector definitely would belong to the subspace that, cause, that uh, causes large errors. And of course, the null space would be something that causes no error at all. So um, that would be the idea that we'll be following throughout the lecture. We will try to, um, we will try to uh, um, find out which errors are problematic and we will take these out and only stay with the rest that cause no error at all. 
And uh, how we're going to do that, the first thing is going to be the singular value decomposition.